We've invited Dr. Deaton to speak with us today about his work on subjective well-being and its potential usefulness in public policy. Welcome, Angus. Thank, Thank you. you. What is subjective well-being and how is it usually measured? Okay. Well, um, the um, subjective part is very important here, too, um, because subjective well-being is, relates to the idea that people have an idea of their own well-being and that we can find out something about well-being simply by asking them. So that whole field of subjective well-being is sort of distinct from the more traditional approaches to well-being, say, in economics, um, where we tended to judge well-being indirectly through um, perhaps the income that people have, um, how healthy they are, um, things like life expectancy, um, whether they live in democracy, all the things that make life good. And the subjective well-being is instead of measuring these things indirectly and inferring how well off someone is by, say, how much income they have, um, you actually ask people. Now, the, what I think is still a wide open question after many years of doing this is just exactly what these answers mean and how they relate to the more traditional uh, measures of well-being that economists and psychologists and other people have been prepared to use. So I think that the economics profession, I'm an economist um, by training, has become much more interested in these things and taken them very much more seriously than once was the case. So the way it's measured is you run a survey, um, you ask people questions um, about their well-being, and there's lots of different questions, and there's one of the topics of research is how you should ask these questions, how reliable they are, what the different questions mean, and so on, and these are the things I'm interested in. I, I should say that I come to this much more skeptically than a lot of investigators do. So I, I'm pursuing what, I might, what you might think of as a dual track on this. The one track says, let's measure these well-being and use them for various purposes, including policy and health and all the things we're interested in. It's a direct measure of well-being. Um, the other track is sort of, look, I'm still an economist. I'm not entirely persuaded that this is a good idea. You know, I don't have to check all my reservations at the door just to work on this. And so, you know, let's see whether these really work or whether they don't really work. And permitting a negative answer. I'm not committed to that. And some of your recent work looks at the distinction between life satisfaction and the intensity of everyday experiences of joy, stress, sadness, and affection. Um, how useful is it to make this distinction? Didn't your own work find, for example, that well-being increases with income, whether you measure well-being using life satisfaction or everyday experiences? Well, that, that last statement is only partially correct, but uh, let me... Um, back up to the first question, which is why it's important to make this distinction. I think it's actually vital to make this distinction. And I think the unwillingness uh, to make this distinction until now, or at least the, the lack of recognition of how important this distinction has tended to muddy um, the field a little bit. Um, I'm very much um, a disciple of Danny Kahneman on this. Um, and he likes to make the distinction between what he calls living life and thinking about life. So living life is these everyday experiences, the moment-to-moment -moment experience of joy, of interest, of boredom, of anger, of stress, of worry, of happiness and sadness, the sort of passing moods that go by like the clouds in the sky sort of idea, and of which there's never really any permanent record, but this is the texture of day-to-day -day life. The other one is if someone asks you to step back and say, how is your life going? That's a cognitive um, question in which you have to think about it and formulate an answer about it. So the, the um, momentary ones are what you might call this feeling of happiness. Um, the cognitive ones are things like life satisfaction. But the word satisfaction has a hedonic component in it too, so that's a little bit of the old one. Or a question we've been using in a lot of our work um, which is the, the, the so-called Cantrell ladder, or it was invented by Cantrell, and it's a ladder question, which says, um, I'd like you to think of a ladder in which the bottom ladder marked zero is the worst possible life you can imagine for yourself, and the top ladder, top rung on the ladder marked 10, is the best possible life you can imagine for yourself. Where would you put yourself on that ladder now? Now, what you said about income 
is these things respond differently to various characteristics that people have. So the thing about income is all of the experienced emotions increase with income, but only up to a point. So what we find in the contemporary US is that up to about $75,000 a year, those things keep on going up. But after $75,000 a year, money just does not seem to matter at all for your affect, for the quality of your emotions, for the degree to which you experience happiness and sadness and so on. Below that, I mean, um, one of the papers, one of the websites that reported on, on Danny and my paper and the PNAS had the best headline that described this research that I could imagine. It was from Gawker.com, and the headline was, Science Proves Poverty Sucks. And so, you know, this is, your life is rotten if you don't have enough money to do these basic things. Now, the cognitive question about how your life is going, that seems to increase with income as far as we have data. <coughs> so, even among the people who've got $150,000 a year, they're still better off than people who have $100,000 a year all the way down. <coughs> so the cognitive um, assessment of how your life is going responds, keeps on responding to money as far as we can see, whereas the emotions don't. Um, other more trivial things is, for instance, people are happier at weekends. They're less sad at weekends. But there's no change in life evaluation at weekends. Um, and that makes sense. Think about it. Your life goes about as well on weekends. You know, it's a longer term judgment. Very interesting. Turning to the question of aging, uh, what does your recent work suggest about how subjective well being changes as one ages? Well, the age thing is, is really a very interesting component of this, and I think that's why the National Institute on Aging is, is um, interested in this work too. So, older people have a good deal less money than younger people, by and large. Many of them are living on pensions. A lot of people are living on Social Security. But almost all of these measures of well-being are higher for older people than they are for younger people. Um, the other thing is about older people is that you know, your health deteriorates as you get older. Um, and you know, I'm at about the point where you begin to really seriously um, realize those things. And the older people, even though they have less money and they have worse health, which you might think were you know, the major, two of the major components of well-being, um, are actually answer these questions more positively um, than younger people. Um, one of the things I've been looking at just over the last few days is what happened during the financial crisis um, to various age groups. And if you track that, I mean, around the time that Lehman Brothers crashed in the middle of two or, you know, the or late summer 2008, um, you've got this enormous catastrophic fall in well-being, and people thought the world was coming apart, and it troughs down over the election, it goes all the way down until about the bottom of the stock market in sort of March 2009, and then there's been a slowly, slow increase since then, though we're still not back to where people were in January 2008. So that's the average, but if you look at people in their 70s and 80s, there's almost none of that. I mean, they just sailed through this financial crisis, and it didn't seem to impact their well-being in the same way. Now, some of that, of course, is that um, you know, unemployment really makes people unhappy. Um, falls in income really makes it. None of that really happened uh, to the elderly um, people. Um, and so it makes sense that not very much would happen to them. But I mean, these are, as far as well-being is concerned, these, um, the elderly or self-reported well-being, the elderly seem to behave quite differently um, from the young, and they respond differently to the way that things are going. So it gives us an, a new lens through which to look at the difference between well-being um, as people age. Now, once again, it's not necessarily the be-all and end-all. You know? And if people are sick, and if they have no money, and they're in poverty, they still have all of these things, even if they think their life is going very well. So you can't necessarily take this and take it as an ultimate final measure um, of what we care about. Finally, turning to uh, policy, there is some suggestion that enhancing subjective well-being might be a public policy goal in the same way that improving a country's wealth or GDP is a policy goal. Uh, can you explain how, what might be some policy implications of this research? Right. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of interest by politicians 
in this. Um, I was a member of the commission that um, President Sarkozy set up. Um, and one of the recommendations of that commission was that we should monitor um, these levels of well-being as well as GDP and so on. I suspect that a lot of the um, message on that was, you know, let's have other measures which show that Fran France does much better than the United States does, unlike GDP, for example. But, I mean, that, that's a legitimate thing. I mean, that the French, for instance, have much more vacation time than Americans do. Um, it's not clear that GDP is a great measure. So we certainly want to have a broad dashboard of measures for public policy. Um, exactly how these will play into policy making, I think, remains to be seen. Um, there's a lot of interest in the U.S. and in European governments in collecting these data and monitoring the well-being of the population, and that's really where we're at now, I think. I think looking at how they behave over time is going to happen before we decide to target them for policy. Um, some of us are a little bit worried about the thing I was just describing at the end. Y you would not wish a government that was presiding over a collapsing economy in which people somehow said, well, we're getting by, you know, we still managed to find a certain amount of happiness in this. We don't have the data, but I suspect people were pretty happy during World War II in Britain when they were being bombed. So and that doesn't mean having the Germans come and bomb you is a good public policy thing. So we're going to have to be very careful about how we do this, and I think that's going to evolve over time. But clearly there's real potential here for another gauge to look at how people are doing. Well, thank you again, Angus, for talking today with us. Thank you very much.